You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin. Ether, Solana, Doge, and more. Cryptocurrencies and digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity, provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments throughout the world's leading crypto derivatives markets. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on The Crypto Rundown. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of crypto derivatives. It's time for The Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody, that music means we are back once again. Time for the Crypto Rundown, the program here on the old Options Insider Radio Network, where we go a little bit beyond our traditional stomp and ground. It's not going to talk your Apples or your VIX or your Tesla or your SPY options here. No, sir. This program is for your Bitcoins and your ETHs and your Solanas, all the fun that goes on there, the volatility, the skew, the OI, the interesting trades, and a whole bunch more. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the T-H-E, optionsinsider.com, as well as from the network upon which so many of you are binging out there these days. Come at you a little bit later than our usual time. Still kicked off right during the peak of the eclipse here in Chicago, listeners. So never let it be said that I am a heartless one to keep our producers from enjoying said eclipse, even if it wasn't really a full, total eclipse here in Chi-Town, more of a, a light partial, if you will. <laughs> but fun stuff cooking out there. If you want fun stuff for yourselves, including a lot of fun stuff that dovetails into the world of crypto, then only one place to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. That's the place to go get awesome pro Q&As. You get my other fun early access and exclusives like the panel I did with our guest here today that we did back in January on the old STA conference talking about all things crypto derivatives and options and everything else. I might chat with the folks at SIBO recently from the FIA conference, options oddities every week, and a whole bunch more great giveaways. Just gave away the March Pro Trading Crate last week. Get your name in the hat now for the April Crate, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. And speaking of my guest, I am joined once again for, let's call it his regular monthly check-in by our old friend, Mr. Greg Magadini, now the director of derivatives over there at Amber Data. Mr. Greg, welcome back to the Crypto Rundown, sir. How goes your Eclipse Monday? You doing any Eclipse spot in your neck of the woods? Hey, thanks for having me back on, Mark. Uh, no Eclipse spotting actually on my side. I don't think we actually uh, get it out here. I'm still uh, in the Pacific Northwest here, so I think I'm a little too far out. 
So no, I missed it, but that's all right. There's plenty of other stuff to look at in the market. So that's keeping me entertained. <laughs> Unfortunately, you didn't miss much. A whole bunch of people right outside the studio here in Chi-Town looking up at the sun on the bridges everywhere. They all have their glasses. Not much happened, but you know, you could say something. It got a little dark. It got a little bit dark. <laughs> so is there eclipse going on right now, listeners in the crypto markets? Let's find out together, shall we? A little bit of the old Bitcoin breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trending activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for The Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Bitcoin Breakdown, the portion of the show where we do just that. We break down all the action in the world's leading digital asset. Yep, I'm talking about the big dog, which is Bitcoin. Is it an eclipse in the crypto markets right now? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it is the opposite of an eclipse. It is full, bright sunshine. Bitcoin back north of that magical, mythical 70K level. In fact, as we kicked off the show, threatening to nip at 72,000, 71,902 when we commenced operations here, right during the height of said eclipse here. Last episode, two weeks ago, listen, of course, we were traveling on the program last week. So on our last episode, Bitcoin still north of the 70K level, 7791. It did dip lower back on the 2nd of April. It broke the 70K level. A lot of hand ringing out there in the crypto space. All the holders starting to sweat. Got down to 65, 457, but they need not sweat because as we said, already back north of the 70K level. In fact, threatening 72,000. Mr. Greg, no eclipse by you. So he had plenty of time to focus on all this Bitcoin price action. What's catching your eye out there this week, sir? Yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously we got the halving coming up, so it's expected to be uh, on April 20th. And so that's a nice kind of a fundamental catalyst for higher prices. And obviously making new all-time highs or flirting with new all-time highs is, is always kind of a bullish signal. And then last week we had the the convenience of a little bit of a deleveraging in the market. The basis has been consistently above the 20% level. And so the pullback last week helped sort of clear out a little bit of excess leverage. So this gets us on a nice footing for, you know, the going into the having event. So I'm, I'm feeling like things are looking pretty good here. Interesting. You know, obviously a lot of people are talking about the having out there. It seems like the last time we went through this dance, at least with ETH, with ETH doing a little bit of, a, of an update there, it kind of came and went. It was a big non-event. In fact, I remember you and I talking about it on the show. doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but it was a little bit ago now, Greg. And you were kind of a little disappointed. You thought it was maybe a bit of a non-event uh, after all the buildup and all the positioning we saw. You think this having, I mean, a lot of people are talking about it. You think it's going to deliver from a you know, volume and a liquidity and a vol perspective? No, I don't think it will deliver. I think that's the consistent theme in crypto vol events is that the implied prices in a lot of potential juice and then the realized fails to materialize. So I think from a volatility perspective, we're actually seeing some pricing in options. We're seeing uh, vol being priced around the 75 handle, uh, whereas realized this is maybe with the exception of today, we'll see how how the next few days play out. But um, it's kind of trading around 62. So there's definitely a little bit of a variance risk premium being priced in. Historically speaking, the vol events seem to disappoint. But from a, a spot drift perspective, I, I definitely think we could see sort of a, a controlled move higher or uh, a move higher period that just fails to meet the vol expectations, but on a spot basis on a get long and and make money on the delta, I think that could actually perform. If I look over the past three halving cycles, the January to December performance is about an average of 200%. And so that puts us on target for, call it $92,000 by the end of the year for Bitcoin. I think the market anticipates a little bit more juice than that. Uh, but from a drift perspective, yeah, this is pretty bullish. And so that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Intriguing stuff. By the way, it was all the way back in September of 2022. We were talking about there was the ETH merge at the time, Greg. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but you know, about a year and a half ago now. Time flies in the crypto markets, 
Mr. Greg. And there was a lot of positioning going into that, a lot of hand wringing, and then it kind of was a bit of a whimper. We'll see if the Bitcoin having can deliver out here, listeners. Uh, from a vol perspective right now, like I said, we had a little bit of a range out there, about 6,000 handles over the course of the past uh, couple of weeks. So vol managing to stay firm. Remember, if you want to see all this data for yourselves, you know where to go. Amberdata.io, the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. We really do only just scratch the surface of all the data. It's only really a one-hour max show at the end of the day. We could probably spend three hours digging into all the gamma profiles and all that fun stuff but uh, kick the tires for yourselves amberdata.io the place to go listeners if you did that you would see firing up the vol let's start near dated as we are wont to do and work our way out a uh, seven day vol again a lot of gamma baked in there too but a lot of people like to hang out near dated these days zero dte all the rage so who are we to look askance at that on the show seven day vol right now listeners at about a 72 even uh, that's a wee bit frothier than it was this time on our last episode. We were a little bit shy of a 69, about a 68 and two-thirds. So getting a little bit juicier out there, which again, as Greg alluded to, the having is nigh. It's coming up in just a few weeks now. So some of that obviously attributing to a little bit of this froth, a little bit of this juice. Also the fact that we are still managing to whip around the 70K level also contributing to that as well let's go out to a more standardized vol metric let's go out 30 days that's where a lot of the products you know and love like vix they tend to line up around that 30 day vol metric on our last show was a 76 coming into this show pretty much unched about a 75 and a half so not a heck of a lot of evolution on the 30 day vol front and if we go a little bit farther out we got six months listeners which is an eternity in most products these days, most products are all about the weeklies, maybe front month if you're lucky. Six months in eternity, if you do that in Bitcoin, you get up to about a 79 right now, which is actually down about two points. It was an 81 on the show this time last week. Greg, anything catching your eye out there on the Bitcoin vol front this week? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of just what I was touching on before, if I look at the term structure, really for the uh, April 26th event, I see a forward vol of about 77. But again, if I look at the realized picture, I'm seeing, you know, 30 day realize about 67. So that's about a 10 point differential. Um, I think there's really interesting structures to be done there. Um, whether you're talking about some sort of like broken wing fly or, or something like that, where you kind of have so, some upside if we kind of drift higher and sort of uh, the out of the money options can kind of decay quicker than, than, than Delta can move up. And if you're looking at sort of structuring something using, you know, the futures basis, whether on CME or some of the offshore exchanges, you still have a pretty elevated uh, basis here. So if I'm looking at like the 90 day basis, I'm seeing about a 22% yield. Whereas just yesterday or over the weekend, we're about 15 to 16% yield. So really this rally is pumping up this basis again. And if we looked at sort of trading the basis through the spot ETF decision, well, pre-decision, call it um, around October to November, really kind of tail end of Q4, the basis was trading at about 6 or 7%. And then right into the decision or the week before the decision, the basis rallied as high as 20. And then post-decision, call it mid-Jan, we're back down to 9 or 8%. So I really think we could see that type of activity come in to the market as well, where you have the basis rally into having, and then as the event passes, uh, not only does implied vol deflate, but then the futures basis kind of deflates as well. So that's pretty interesting for sort of the selling those out of the money options and, and owning uh, something closer to the money or closer at the money against it. So much going on in the world of crypto derivatives these days. Of course, we just had, as you mentioned, the ETF approval. Seems like a lifetime ago, Greg, it was only January, <laughs> and then everyone's still waiting with bated breath for the options on those ETFs, haven't really materialized yet, SEC, still a little bit skittish for whatever reason about approving those, then of course we have the halving coming up, so a lot of events to drive some action out here right now. Uh, let's see what's being reflected in the SKU, shall we? Let's remember, the SKU kind of showing us how the options market is lining up in terms of what they're looking forward to, what they're afraid of what they're pricing in going forward out here. Let's start again seven days and move our way out. Seven day skew last show, almost a positive two, about one and three quarters. So pretty much a whole bunch of nothing for the most part. Not a heck of a lot of premium in either direction or a discount for that matter. Uh, this show a little bit juicier, about exactly a point, two and three quarters. 
So again, modestly bullish, but again, all things considered, not a heck of a lot of bias in one direction or the other. Let's go out 30 days and see if we can find any more insight, shall we? And last show, we were at a positive three and a half. Coming into this show, a whopping three and a quarter. So pretty much unchanged there as well. If you go a little bit farther out, though, go out about six months, things look a little bit different out there. Obviously, things traditionally, I mean, outside of the depths of crypto winter, most of the time you're going to see a long-term bullish bias to products like Bitcoin, and that's reflected in the skew. You're going to see a bias to the upside going out longer term. And that is the case again right now, even though it has come in a little bit. It was a positive six and a quarter this time last show, coming in and start of the show today, about four and a quarter. So still frothy, still looking a little bit to the upside, but not quite, shall we say, as juicy to the upside as it was on our last episode. Greg, anything catching your eye out there this week from an overall skew perspective out there in Bitcoins? Yeah, so really, if you look at um, the April 26th skew, you have you definitely see the call wing being bid. What's really interesting is you can overlay the ETH skew and the Bitcoin skew and really look at that differential. And so if I look at April 26, the call wing in Bitcoin is very elevated, whereas the put wing in ETH is actually elevated. But if we go a little bit farther out to, say, uh, June 28th or September uh, expiration, they're really kind of neck and neck and everything's perfectly uh, aligned really nicely. So what that's really telling me is we, we really see sort of the call wing being priced in here into the halving event. And so, again, I think there's really interesting sh trades to, to do against that flow. And I'm going to throw you a curveball here, Greg, because I was just talking about how we really just scratched the surface on all the cool tools you guys have to offer over there. We talk a lot of ski. We talk a lot of vol because those are those are the big dogs. That's what people want to hear. But if you had to dig a little bit deeper, if you had to say, you know, here's a cool tool we have cooking over here that we don't really talk about on the show, but you think would be useful for the folks, at least on the Bitcoin front right now. So what jumps to the top of mind for you? Yeah, actually. So one of the things we're, we're developing right now, which is really interesting, is we're doing uh, fitted surfaces. So fitted SVI surfaces. Um, which is really interesting because once you have like a appropriately calibrated fit, you can start pricing in non-standard options with like weird uh, strike prices. Let's say you want to look at like seventy thousand seven hundred and fifty-two dollars, some, something like that. You can get good theoretical prices there. Um, and then from there, what we're going to do is we're going to do calibrated surfaces for, or we're going to do uh, volatility surfaces for altcoins that don't have listed markets against them. And that gives us a really good idea of, you know, how to how are the uh, dynamics of an individual altcoin being priced? So what is sort of the risk neutral uh, uh, probability density distribution and then converted that into options? Now you can get a really good idea of how those things would theoretically be priced. And so I'm very hopeful that the DeFi options world is going to be the pioneer of trading a lot of altcoin optionality that you can't find anywhere else. Um, so that's something that we're working on and I think is really interesting. Um, and so we'll have that online pretty soon. Fascinating stuff. Listeners, we need a three-hour show, Greg, and then we can get into all, all this stuff in, in a lot more detail. Uh, I said, let's keep on rolling. Let's go out to some of the other products you folks like to sling out there. Uh, but actually, before we get there really quickly, let's take a quick pit stop in over there at the OI. See what's open for size out there on Deribit, and the answer is most of it's coming in obviously we are recording this pretty much a week into april we all know what happens in the crypto space particularly with eth but it also obviously impacts bitcoin as well and that is once a quarterly rolls off the board after expiration it takes a ton a metric ton of oi with it and that's pretty much the case right now in the bitcoin options over there on Deribit. the calls are down to only 163,000 open that's down a whopping 43,000 from our last show, the puts down to 79,000. That's down 39,000 from our last show. So again, we talked about it before. I won't be laboring on the show this week. A crypto loves a quarterly, <laughs> and that is reflected out here in the OI, end of the year in particular as well. We see a lot of a lot of OI really roll off the board with these expiration. We'll get to that more a little bit when we get to ETH. Right now, let's get out some of the other products you folks like to sling. Bitto, a popular one, 31 and a half when we're kicking off the show. That actually puts it down about three quarters of a point where it was on our last show. Uh, the ADV also coming in as well. It seems like maybe a little bit of that dip below 70K in Bitcoin maybe cooled 
some of the enthusiasm for some of these products, at least from an options perspective, because that ADV is still frothy, still 114000 It's way higher than when it was 20000 not that long ago. But it's also down 24,000 contracts a day from our last show. Uh, today, beating that, though, so maybe going to move back in the other direction. 131,000 contracts on the tape out there in Biddle Land. In terms of vol, the 30-day vol is at about an 88, up 7 points. So still managing to remain frothy. Not a lot of products out there uh, that can threaten a 90 from a 30-day vol perspective. Listen to some of our other shows, listeners, like This Week in Futures Options. You'll hear us run the gamut from metals to fixed income to FX to equities to ags. Not many products really outside of crypto and a little bit of energy that can really threaten these types of vol levels out here. So uh, still impressive stuff out here. And in terms of size, you know it's open for size in Biddle right now. 104,000 of the Jan 30s. They love their long-term upside in Biddle. They have for quite some time. 73,000 of the Jan 35s. You know my thought on those. Not my favorite, especially when something pays as hefty of a dividend as Biddle does to just load up on the out-of-the-money options because obviously you're missing out on all of that juice. But clearly, if the underlying is exploding, you'll still do well at the end of the day. Let's get out to one of our other favorites out here, Mara. Then we'll get uh, Greg's thoughts on all this. He usually has a couple other fun products we can throw into the mix as well. Mero is at an 18 and a quarter when we kicked off the show. Down three and a quarter points. Man, if you want a product that has been delivering on the vol front, Mero has been all over the place over the last couple of months. 15 up to almost 30, back down to almost 15 again. Right now, 18 and a quarter. Down three and a quarter points from our last show. So Mara just whipsawing all over the place. Uh, the ADV also coming in quite a bit as well. It was over 400,000 on our last show. It's down to 296 right now. That's down 136,000 contracts a day. That's a lot of paper to go to go away, listeners. I mean, a lot of products don't do that in a week, and Mara giving that up in a day. So interesting stuff. Uh, today, it doesn't seem like you're going to get there. Only 186,000 contracts on the tape. So maybe, I don't know, are we, are we past peak Mara at this point, at least from an options perspective? I never want to say never with this product because this thing whipsaws all over the place. The big position out there right now on the options front are the April 30s. These go away, standard monthly expiration, so they'll go away in about a, a couple of weeks, listeners. Uh, so April 30s, again, we're at 18 and a quarter right now. So 30 seems like perhaps a bit of a bridge too far. But if you want a little bit more time, number two, there are 23,000 of the June 30. So if past is prologue, people are probably buying those. And uh, June expiration 30 handle probably a little bit more doable uh, than april but a lot to unpack greg what are your thoughts on our old favorites biddo and mara that a lot of our listeners like to sling in their options account and then i know you like some of maybe the leverage bit x what else is catching your eye out there yeah well i'm right with you on the biddo you know those out of money options um there's really that dampening effect on on the biddo price through that dividend and through the contango so let, let's not forget that that basis which is currently around 20% annualized is definitely affecting uh, the Biddo contract. So there's a, there's a lot of bleed to Biddo just naturally. And then if you want to compound that bleed, go out into bit X and now you have the two X Biddo plus the, you know, always dropping from a higher denominator than rallying from a lower de denominator effect, which are all the two X and three X ETFs d display. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Mara is really interesting. I still I still don't have the uh, inspiration to really dig into Mara, but I always wonder with these miners, you know, the having effect definitely affects their revenue because the the blocks that they win um, will have just a half half the amount of Bitcoin awarded, and so I kind of wonder um, how that will affect. Like obviously, um, the having is bullish for Bitcoin. But Bitcoin really needs to rally substantially to sort of offset the lower block reward in terms of revenue for miners. So there actually might be some some underperformance in, in Mara from those types of, of effects. But that's a that's a fundamental point that I'm not an expert on, but it's definitely something worth exploring for those trading that. Yeah, Mara is a bit of a funky one. Obviously, other things driving it, not just the price of Bitcoin, which adds to the the fun factor, I suppose, Greg, for some folks, maybe adds to the intimidation for some other people out there as well. By the way, while you were talking, I just looked up the most recent dividend payouts for Biddo. It paid, this is now a $31.5 stock or ETF. They paid 72 cents in March, Greg, and a whopping buck 14 this April for the dividend. You're talking nearly $2 in dividends just in the last month and a half. <laughs> uh, so if you're not, 
if you're not capturing that, listeners, you're, you're missing out on a lot. The d- annualized dividend yield is nearly 50%. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to just load up on the out-of-the-money calls in a product like this for that specific reason. Uh, but intriguing stuff nonetheless. Speaking of intriguing stuff, let's see if we can find some more as we explore the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, everybody, let's do it. Let's dive into the altcoin universe. Man, this top 10 by market cap, you could just do a whole show on this every week, quite frankly. There's enough evolution going on out there, and it seems like we have that going on again this week, listeners, my goodness, just evolution, especially at the bottom half of the top 10. We've seen Doge flipping around. We've seen Avalanche. We've seen Tron. This week, forget all of those <laughs> with the exception of Doge. Spoiler alert. A Doge looking a little bit frothier out there, but we'll get there. We'll get there in a second. Uh, coming at number 10 this week, listeners, a newcomer, at least for as long as we've been crunching these numbers in the top 10. Uh, this is Ton Coin, ticker symbol Ton. <laughs> Uh, I was at six and a quarter when we ran this uh, this data up. I should say twenty one point six billion worth of market cap. So we are we are definitely leaping up here in terms of how much it costs to break into the top ten. Used to be not that long ago, seven, eight, less than ten billion was enough to break into the top ten. Now it costs you twenty one, almost twenty two billion. Shows you how times have changed in the crypto market. Number nine is our old friend Cardano, twenty one point eight billion. Number eight, yep, clinging once again. To the number eight spot, it is Doge, listeners, 29.4 billion. Number seven, USD coin, 32.6 billion. Number six, our old friend XRP. Can it get out of its own way? Spoiler alert, not really this week, listeners, 34.3 billion. Number five, it's Solana, 80.6 billion. I got a feeling we'll come back to that one in a little bit. Number four, it's BNB, 88 billion, pretty much exactly. Number three, it's Tether, because of course it is, 107 billion. Number two, it's ETH, 441, and the big dog this week, Bitcoin, 1.41 trillion. I almost said billion. It's easy for me to say. Trillion worth of market cap out there, listeners. Man, how the mighty have rallied out there. Let's see if that also applies to our old friend ETH, and the answer is kind of. We are at 3629 on our last show, 3696 this week, so not even 70 handles to the upside when you compare it to Bitcoin. Looks a little bit calmer by comparison. If you expand that out to the end of our last show, though, listeners, things look a little bit more topsy-turvy. We got as low as about 3282 on our last show, listeners, and then coming into, obviously, the high was... Pretty much this morning, almost 3,700. Pretty much right now as we kicked off the show, 3,696, the low coming last Tuesday, listeners. So intriguing stuff out there. Before we get into the vol and all that fun, listeners, Greg, what are your thoughts on, A, the evolution of the top 10 from a market cap perspective? The bottom half of the top 10 has just been a slugfest over the last few months, watching all these projects and coins just fighting it out to make their way into the top 10. So what are your thoughts on these? And then B, uh, what are your thoughts on our perennial number two ETH? Yeah, so as far as the top 10, I still think Dogecoin has some surprises up its sleeve. Um, T-O-N, ADA, Shiba Inu, which I guess is not top 10, but it's right there fighting it all, out all the time. I'm just kind of think i don't know uh, they're kind of trash coins i they're not i don't i'm not i'm not super interested in, in following them um for ethereum though i think ethereum's got some really interesting things so in my mind ethereum has the same value proposition in terms of the supply dan- dynamics so obviously bitcoin having is reducing the supply issuance issuance rate ethereum actually currently has a flat to negative issuance rate since uh, EIP-1559 came into play and there's a burn for each transaction. Then we have the ETF, like the spot ETF dynamics. So I think right now the market is soured around a May 31st ETF approval for ETH, but that's okay. I mean, we get the rejection and, and kind of revisit this later. Um, there is an open question around whether ETH is a security. I think that's still kind of up in the air from the SEC's perspective. I think that is definitely weighing down on prices. But assuming that ETH is not a security and it's sort of like the um, 
foundational settlement layer for all the L2s and all the DeFi projects built on top of that. And now we're, we're having L3s. Um, I actually think the supply dynamics for Ethereum and, and the, um, the reasons why we're bullish Bitcoin are even more so true for Ethereum. And if I look at the CME open interest for the ETH contract, it's still relatively small and stable and smaller than Binance, whereas Bitcoin open interest for a CME contract has surpassed any other offshore exchange. And so I think the U.S. market or the U.S. institutional side hasn't actually started buying ETH yet. And so we're actually, once we get past sort of the Bitcoin narrative of having, the next sort of headline events are going to be around Ethereum. And so I think that's kind of an interesting play. And then once we get out into, say, ETHE, that grayscale Ethereum trust, that's trading at a pretty big discount right now, pricing in a failure of the spot ETF approval. Um, there's some interesting stuff to be done there, too. So no ton coin for you and your personal wallet there. <laughs> Great. <No. laughs> <laughs> Which, if you're curious, listener, stands for the open network for crypto ninjas, what they say. <laughs> uh, it's designed by the folks who's like behind Telegram. Rocketing its way into the top 10 this week. Again, that's why you got to at least pay tangential attention to that top 10 listeners, because it is moving all over the place, even if you don't love it. Uh, intriguing stuff nonetheless. Let's get out to see what's intriguing in the land of ETH from a vol perspective. Uh, ETH looking a little bit frothier than it was this time in our last show. Seven-day vol, 71 and a half on our last episode, 76 today, so looking a little bit firmer. Is that the case as we go a little bit farther out? The answer is yes, 74 and three quarters on the 30-day vol last episode, 77 and a half this week, so rallying there nearly three points. Going out six months, different story, 80 and a half on our last show, and exactly 80 and a half again this week, so no real evolution there. Let's go out to the skew front, see what the options are pricing in. Are they buying what Greg is selling here, that uh, after the Bitcoin halving, we're going to see a lot of action out here in ETH? Well, let's find out. We wouldn't see that in the seven-day skew, listeners, which probably explains why it's pretty much treading water. It was two and a half to the upside on our last show, three and a half this week, so... I guess you can call it slightly more biased to the upside, but at the end of the day, not a heck of a lot. 30-day skew, similar. It was pretty much flat on our show two weeks ago. This week coming in about two and two-thirds, so moving slightly to the upside. Again, nothing crazy out there. And going out a little bit farther, a little bit longer term, uh, actually coming in again. We have uh, positive six and a half on our last show. This week, positive four and a half, so... A little bit of evolution on the longer term ETH skew front, which is kind of interesting. As I alluded to earlier, as we get out there to Deribit, we saw just an annihilation of open interest on the ETH front. 1.6 million calls surviving on Deribit right now. That's down almost a million, almost 900,000, about 860,000 from our last show. So that's, that's quite the cut off the top. That's losing a limb out there. Puts, uh, same deal, 670,000 puts remaining. That's down a whopping 520,000 from this time on our last show. So, yeah, they are coming for ETH options, and they took a lot of them with them post-March expiration. Greg, anything catching your eye out there from a vol or from an overall skew perspective in ETH this week, sir? Yeah, so just kind of back to the the concept of the spot ETF approval, the ETHE um, Grayscale Trust right now is trading at about a 23% discount, whereas the futures basis is still trading at about a 20% premium. So if you're trying to trade the ETF approval or decision, uh, there's a really interesting trade to be done there. You can buy ETHE in your brokerage sell the CME futures against it, sort of on a dirty delta neutral basis. And I say dirty because those those products can trade uh, not in lockstep, but there is a, you know, 50, call it 46% uh, yield, annualized yield in that type of trade on an almost delta neutral basis. So that's a really interesting trade in my mind on just kind of the pure vol perspective. Again, the short-term uh, ETH put skew, at least as of this morning, I think today was kind of a crazy day, um, was trading at a premium. So I think that's pretty interesting to see that out of lockstep with Bitcoin. Um, theoretically, those assets are so highly correlated 
that Bitcoin and ETH should have pretty similar skew profiles. So when they diverge, there's interesting trades to be done there. And then lastly, I do think, you know, the Bitcoin halving is sort of a sell the news event, but I like to think of it as a potential rotate into the alts event. So once Bitcoin halving is behind us, really, as I alluded to earlier, the dynamics for Ethereum become sort of the headline event. The ETH Bitcoin ratio is at sort of, uh, you know, multi-year lows right now, trading about 0.05%. So I think there's definitely the potential of a rotation back into Ethereum, bringing that ratio back to the 0.06, 0.07, 0.08 range, which really puts Ethereum back testing the new the all-time highs of about $5,000. So I think there's some interesting stuff to be done there as well. You're not the first person to come on recently and talk about the ETH trust and maybe uh, some of that discount going the way of the Dodo if these things are approved. So you're right. That is kind of an intriguing play. Uh, the ETH trust of Grayscale, kind of the lesser heralded of the two. Everyone knows about the Grayscale Bitcoin trust. Not as many maybe know about the ETH trust, but uh, intriguing discount to be had there. If you know, people have also been coming on lately, Greg, talking about ETH Classic again. I can't recall the last time we really talked about ETH Classic on this network, and yet all of a sudden over the last few months, people have been coming on talking up ETH Classic again. Are you intrigued by ETH Classic again, as way some of our other guests are, or have you kind of moved past that? No. I, In my mind, some of these altcoins, they're like options themselves. So there's definitely good money to be made if, if you're someone following this stuff and and really deep in the weeds and the discords and understanding, you know, who's building what and things like that. For me personally, um, if there's no options on it, I'm just not really that interested in it. So I, I think people can make money in ETH Classic. From my perspective, it's not something that I'm trading, paying attention to, or holding in any way. All right, let's keep on rolling to a product. Maybe some of you are, probably more of you are holding now than did <laughs> at the beginning of the year. This is Solana. This thing's been on the rampage. Coming back. A little bit this week it was 192.10 on our last show pretty much 181.10 this show so down about 11 handles since our last episode as you pointed out on our last show and as greg pointed out on his last appearance here on the program starting to see some solana start to trickle in over there on darabit again which means hey guess what we can crunch some numbers on it again which is always fun if you're wondering how much paper is open in solana options right now it's not a ton but it's, it's getting there again. 20,500 calls open right now. Uh, that's against 10,400 puts. So a roughly two to one calls over puts ratio, which is about what we see in a lot of the other products out there these days as well. If you're wondering what's the vol in Solana, you know it's going to be juicy. You know it's going to be frothy. It was a 118. This is, again, the seven-day vol. That's pretty much all the data we can pull on it right now because it hasn't really been trading for that long again over there on Darabit. Seven-day vol was at a, nearly a 120 on our last show. It's come down to about a 98 on the start of this show and uh skew wise seven day skew it was pretty much a uh a positive nine out there which puts it unched from where it was this time on our last show out there so intriguing stuff by the way if you're wondering i mentioned the oi if you're wondering what the size position is in solana options right now it looks like it's the 220 calls remember i said we were at about a 181 and change when we kicked off the show this week, the 220 calls, there's a little over 2,000, but almost 2,200 of those open right now. So that is the largest open position in Solana options right now, which is also interesting. 220, not that long ago, would have seemed like a laughable strike. And now fast forward a few months, and it does seem like it's within spitting distance. Greg, I know on your last appearance, you, were, you said you were starting to pay more attention to Solana again as they were starting to get some OI and some volume over there on Deribit. Anything catching your eye out there in the world of Solana these days, sir? Yeah, so Solana has really been sort of the high flyer in terms of altcoins uh, year to date. And if I look at the volatility, I kind of see just kind of a slow grind recently from about 150 down to 100. So obviously, that's kind of the bigger, the biggest altcoin vol that we've seen. That we've well, it's the biggest vol play out there in terms of absolute level of vol. So I think there's definitely you know some the potential for Solana to be high flying once again. There's a little bit of a fundamental headwind for Solana as like transactions are failing a lot. The network still seems to go down. So that's kind of on the con side. But on the pro side, it's really uh, we're seeing a lot of like airdrops and new projects rebuilding on Solana. 
And so if there's any sort of like mass adoption in terms of developer power and, and projects coming online, well, I could definitely see it sort of re-threaten the ETH throne, which means a lot higher prices. And to catch up, it has to do so pretty quickly. And to do that, there has to be a lot of upside vol. So there's definitely some plays to be done out there in terms of upside vol on Solana versus you know related peers such as Ethereum. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. And vol is at kind of a, a recent low, so to speak, where in mid-March we saw it as 150, and today we're about call it 95-ish for the 30-day. So that's kind of that's kind of interesting to me. Wow, Solana coming for the E throne, maybe it's got a ways to go <laughs> to get there, but yeah, that could certainly that could certainly be a game changer out there in the crypto markets. Might be a fun question of the week for our listeners too, Greg. You think Solana can eventually vie for uh, the number two spot? Maybe who knows? Maybe even the number one spot overall out there in the crypto space. Hit us up, let us know, listeners, as we run down uh, some other altcoin out here this week. XRP, like we said. Still struggling to get out of its own way. It was 65 cents on the last show, 62 and a half cents. So giving up another couple of cents. That's pretty much the story of XRP from time immemorial. Can't get out of its own way. Uh, Dogecoin doing the opposite, though. 18.1 cents on the show last time. 20, almost 21 cents. So gaining a whopping two cents out there. Nothing to sneeze at. You're starting at a base of 18 cents. <laughs> uh, so nothing to sneeze at out there. Hence, it's clinging to the number eight spot. Uh, Litecoin having a nice week, 90 and about two thirds on our last episode, 103 and about three quarters on the start of this show. So right around 13 handles to the upside. Uh, Cardano giving up some of the go, 66 cents last episode, 61 cents uh, this week. Polkadot, nine and three quarters last episode, nine bucks even this week. So giving up about three quarters of a buck. And everyone's favorite Shiba Inu, pretty much treading water. It was a whopping million zeros, 2966 this week. It is a 2881. Before we roll out of the altcoin universe, Greg, you always have a couple intriguing altcoin in your back pocket. Anything you want to share with the folks this week? Yeah, so I think from just kind of a speculative uh, standing, and this is not an altcoin play, but this is kind of like uh, an airdrop uh, eligibility play. So I think I really think the Coinbase wallet makes sense to download. So that's kind of like a MetaMask competitor. I think it makes a lot of sense to have a, that's typically a EVM, so like Ethereum-based wallet. It makes a lot of sense to have money on base, which is also uh, an Ethereum L2. So I think using base, using uh, protocols on base, typically that would be something that would make you eligible for an airdrop if, if Coinbase ever does an airdrop, which who knows. But the, the cost, if you're wrong and nothing happens, is basically zero. And if something does happen, um, that's kind of an interesting play. I also think using MetaMask and using sort of their... Uh, wallets and swap functions. MetaMask re recently launched a portfolio tool. I would definitely recommend using that. I do think you know Consensus, which is one of the biggest investors uh, in the Ethereum space, is one of the major shareholders in MetaMask. I wouldn't be surprised that we get a MetaMask airdrop at some point. And then um, another project, DeFi Llama, which is a um, sort of an aggregator in terms of DeFi projects. Uh, they recently launched a swap function. I think using that potentially makes you eligible for airdrop if they ever do one. Again, I'm not sure that we'll get airdrops across these projects, but there's a lot of uh, positive expected value to just using projects, using chains, things like that. And you're not really taking much risk, if, if any risk at all. So that's what I highly, uh, you know, be engaged or, or, or urge listeners to, to look into. DeFi Llama. I love it, listeners. And let's see what you folks love. A little bit of your crypto questions. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, everybody. Welcome to the crypto questions. This week, we're actually going to pay off a question that was asked during our last episode, which was quite simply, Q1 was drawing to a close at the time. We said, which market segment are you the most excited about? You know, excited could be anything. Usually it means potential for upside, but you can define excited however you like. We gave you three choices and the infamous other, equities, crypto, volatility, or other. A lot of you chose other as fixed income, so a lot of write-ins for the treasuries out there. But actually, Greg, what took it 
was volatility, 43.3%. So a lot of our audience liking themselves a little bit of vol right now, which is kind of interesting. What are you up to? Are you specking to the upside in products like VIX? Are you playing the infamous erosion trade, which is getting a little bit more difficult? But, you know, never know. You can always pick up those pennies over and over again or maybe something else. Hit us up. Let us know. But number two, Greg, very germane to this show, was crypto with 30%. So 30% of our audience saying they're most excited about the potential for the crypto market over the rest of the year. Equities coming in a distant third. Only 20% of you are as excited about equities for the rest of the year, which is kind of fascinating. And again, 6.7% choosing other, which I know a lot of you wrote in for fixed income. So Greg, does that surprise you that fully pretty much a third of our audience is most excited for crypto going forward? I think that makes a lot of sense. Crypto's a, it's just more of a fair playing field in my mind. Um, it's still a developing market and there's a lot of edge to be had. And a lot of the, the most knowledgeable people in crypto are people who've learned on their own and, and spent their own time and are by all uh, traditional metrics, retail investors, but they know more than anyone else, including the big banks who are kind of behind, behind the, uh, the curve on this one. So I think uh, it is the most interesting market. All right. We'll have to leave it there. Listeners hope you're having a good start to your trading week. Remember, stay tuned to the network for all the rest of the great content we have coming at you. I know a lot of you listening to this program still newer to the world of options. So if you're intrigued, you have questions, of course, you check out our pro Q&As on theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. You should also be checking out some of our basic educational content like Options Bootcamp, Options Playbook Radio, literally hundreds of episodes of those shows that you could download and enjoy on your own schedule and really will get you up to speed with a lot of the terms that we're bandying about on this show all the time, like skew and volatility and term structure and all these other fun things that we say here all the time. And then, of course, make sure you check out all the other stuff you like, volatility. Greg has been on our volatility view show. It's always a popular one. We go deep into the world of volatility there. A lot of fun stuff to be found there, as well as I have mentioned on this show a number of times, This Week in Futures Options. That's the only other show on the network where really crypto pops in on a regular basis because it is still a volatility leader amongst all the products over there at CME Group, even if it isn't really a volume leader yet, but intriguing stuff nonetheless. Greg, if folks are intrigued, they want to kick the tires and light the fires over there at Amber Data, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, absolutely. Well, come to pro.amberdata.io to check out a bunch of charts and see how vol is lining up and things like that. If you want to learn a little bit about the weekly wrap up that we publish every week, um, what's going on in crypto and crypto vol, you can go to substack.amberdata.com. And then finally, if you want to just uh, check out some tutorials or just some educational content online, we have a YouTube channel and that's uh, Amber Data Derivatives. There you go, listeners. Kick the tires and light the fires over there at Amber Data. Again, we just scratched the surface on all the data that's coming down the pike over there. That is going to do it for the Crypto Rundown. Back with our usual array of content throughout the rest of the week until we're back again next Monday. Another episode of the Crypto Rundown. Stay safe out there, everybody. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. 
select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. <laughs>